Um, this is the example that we were going through at the end of the last lecture, trying to kind of combine all the various things that we learned about moving versus copying, population, and so on. And we went through maybe the first, I think the first couple of uh, cases in the main function, so lines 18 and 19, I think we finished at line 20. And we were just looking at the functions that are called up above here, and the conclusions we came to is that when func1 and func2 are propagating the, the value they're returning back to the caller, uh, func1 is required to elide that copy, whereas func2 isn't. And then this will cause some differences in terms of some of the analysis we need to do below. And I think that that was the point where we stopped in the last lecture. I just want to point out, um, I was looking, this slide is slightly different, just one line is different from what you, we were looking at in the last lecture. I noticed there was one case that was kind of trivial, but still I thought I maybe should add it in here. Um, so line 22 wasn't there before, but it doesn't, if you work through the results on your own, it won't have any effect. It's just that you won't have an answer for that one line, which probably is the easiest line in the whole thing anyway. Um, anyway, so I'm just gonna walk through, hopefully people have had a chance to, to try the example and work through on their own. What I'll do is I'll just kind of walk through and explain the answer for each of the lines. Um, and people can ask questions if they, if they need clarifications about things. Um, so starting at line 20, which again, I think is where we left off. Um, this line is going to result in the, by the way, the CTOR is just an abbreviation for constructor. So this is the default constructor. So this line here is going to invoke the default constructor and, and basically nothing else. There's not going to be any copies because they're elided. Uh, so what's going to happen is um, when func1 gets called because the propagating of the return value, value back from func1 is required to be elided, uh, the return value of gadget, this default constructed gadget, will be constructed directly into you using a default constructor. So the only thing that happens on this line is the default constructor gets involved. Um, line V is, is similar except for the fact that we're not required, that, the compiler is not required to elide the copy that propagates the return value of G back to the caller. So because of this, the only, essentially the only thing that changes is that instead of having an elided copy like we do on line 20, and line 21, we may need to either move or copy. We might not elide the copy. In the case that we don't elide the copy, then the question becomes, well, do we move or do we copy? Um, so for this, we have to look at the actual uh, function uh, definition here. So here we're returning G. Uh, G is an L value. However, if you remember, there's a, a special case rule that's handled for the you have to use to handle return statements of functions. In other words, the, the kind of the default behavior of whether move or copy is used is kind of overridden here. And kind of to, to simplify the rule as much as possible, effectively what it does is says treat the return expression as an R value, even if it's not, and then try to uh, propagate the return value back. In this case, if we treat this as an R value expression, this is going to pick up the move constructor, so it will move. So in this case, we're going to uh, use a, a move operation. If it's not elided, it could be elided, and probably for any, a reasonable compiler with any decent optimizer would probably optimize out the, the uh, they probably elide the copy for something as simple as this function here. Uh, but you're not guaranteed that it will happen though. So that's at least lines 20 and 21. Line 22, um, which is the one line that I added from the example we had at the, at the end of the previous lecture, this will just use the copy constructor. We're going to propagate the value from V to W. V is an L value expression, so it can't move, so it's going to copy. Um, the next line, bunch of lines that follow are basically things we're doing assignments. Uh, so this is just a, a direct move assignment um, because we're using std move because of this the right hand side of the equal sign the expression here std move of t is what, what we call an r value expression more specifically it's an x value expression std move is an x value um, because of this it's going to invoke, invoke the move assignment operator rather than the copy assignment operator in the case of the next line here uh, this is going to invoke the copy assignment operator because S is an L value expression. It's a named object. Named objects are L value expressions. So because of this, it's not safe to do a move. As far as the compiler is concerned, it will do a copy. Um, the next two lines here, 25 and 26, are very similar to what we have in lines 20 and 21. The difference is that in, in these cases, line 20 and 21, the place where we're sticking the return value from func1 and func2, we're putting the results directly into, or we're putting them directly into the thing that we're constructing, either u or v on these two lines. Whereas here, the we can't directly construct the return value, the function in s, because we're assigning to s. s already exists. We can't just violently construct something on top of an already constructed variable. 
Uh, so there, this is why copy elision, it only applies to things that are being constructed. It doesn't make sense to say, well, can I somehow elide this assignment operation? It doesn't make sense. Um, so where the, where the, when we, if we elide the copy and, and propagating the value back from either one of these two functions here, where, it's the, where the aligning is happening is we're going to be constructing the return value directly into a temporary object in the caller that holds the return value uh, rather than into the value of the variable s. Um, but otherwise, the, pa the pattern that's followed is, si is similar. But basically, we have in the case of uh, line 20, we have a default constructor and then we have to require to elide the copy. Here we have a default constructor. We're required to elide the copy. So what will happen is the, the gadget object, which is uh, default constructed inside Funk1, will be placed directly into a temporary object that holds the return value. And then that temporary object will be used for a move assignment. This is where the move assignment comes from, to assign the return value of the function to s. And then going from line 25 to line 26 is basically the same story. The only difference is that unlike the case of line 25 where the copy is elided, when we're here when we're returning the value back from the from func1 to the caller, it's required that the copy that does this is elided, whereas in this case it's not required. So the only difference is in the case of func2, we may also have either a move or copy happening to propagate the return value from the function back up to the caller. Um, then the question becomes, well, is it a move or is it a copy? If it's not elided, which one does it do? Again, we look at the, the code for the function. Although we're returning an L value, again, return statements have a special rule. We're returning a local variable of the function. Um, so it's allowed to be treated first as an R value, in which case a move would happen. So this is, we're going to use a move to propagate the return value back. So this is why it says move constructor here. And then the... The, the assignment of the return value of func2 to s, this is going to be done via move because the expression on the right-hand side of the equal sign is a, is a R value expression, so it will be able to do a move. Again, the return, if you have an expression which is the result of a function that returns by value, which is what we have here, func2 bracket bracket, is the result of a function that returns by value, this is an R value expression. So this is why move is used here. Um, then here we're calling func3, and func3, if we look up above here, it takes a gadget by value, so we're passing by value. So we have s sitting in the caller, it's a local variable of the caller. We somehow have to get s in, into g, because g is a local variable of function being called. Well, we have to do this by copying, either copying or moving. In this case, because the thing, the source for the copy or move is an L value expression, s is a named object, named objects are L values, this is going to do a copy, because it wouldn't be safe to be doing a move in this case. If we replace s by std move of s, then this will do a move. It will invoke the move constructor. Because again, std move, the whole purpose of std move is basically to force a move to happen. Um, so the, in terms of the mechanics of it, std move of s is an R value expression, therefore it will be safe to do a move. And then lastly, this is probably the most tricky one of all of them. Um, this is going to result in sing, just a single default constructor being invoked for the gadget class. What's going to happen here is we're calling func1, uh, or sorry, we're calling func3, and we're passing to it the return value of func1. So if there's no copy elision, what would happen is we call func1. This is going to default construct a gadget, which then gets copied into a temporary object in the caller. And then that temporary object in the caller is then propagated to the, the parameter g of func3. Um, but because the compiler is required to, allow, to not create temporary objects, except when it really has to, and in this case, both of the copies that are required must be elided. They're both required to be elided. So the, the copy that would propagate the return value of this function back to the caller, uh, because we're returning a pure R value expression here, it must be elided. And also, the thing that's being passed to func3 when we're passing this uh, pure R value expression here into func3, this also must be elided. So essentially what happens, because both of the copies are elided, the temporary object that would be kind of the middleman for those copies is eliminated because they don't need to exist if you don't do the copies in the first place. So essentially what happens in this, on, on this line of code here is when this function gets called, it's going to directly construct its return value into the local variable of the function func3 that's about to be called. So that, that's all that happens. Anyway. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So that's all, all about uh, copy elision, thankfully. Um, now I'm just going to make a few additional comments about moving and copying. We're almost done this. Then we can go on to some other less tedious stuff. 
Um, so this slide has also already been largely covered from other material. It's just pointing out that std move is a, is a template number function. If you really care how it's defined, it's defined. Sorry, temp, it's a template function. I don't know what I just said. It's a template function. Anyway, it's defined typically something looking like this. But don't worry too much about what's going on here. There's some gross stuff about what happens in C++ when you have references to references and they don't make sense. So you have to collapse them into some other type. And then this causes other complications. But effectively, if you ignore these things, all this is doing is it's just doing a static cast. So you're, you're passing it a parameter x of some type t. And it's just converting it into a T ref ref. It's basically converting it into an R value reference of type T. Functions that return R value references are X values or more generally R value expressions, which will force a move to happen. But you normally wouldn't write a static cast. Instead, you would just use std move. But that's largely been covered. Um, the only other thing is I want to do, I just want to talk about like a swap. This is like a very classic kind of algorithm. You have two. Two variables of the same type, so we have like an X and Y, which are both objects of type T, and we want to swap their values. So of course we pass by value because if we're surpassed by reference, because if we pass by value to this function, we'd be swapping local copies and we wouldn't actually change anything in the caller. So we're passing by reference. And the, the prototypical way that you would implement this, you know, if you didn't care about efficiency at all, is you would implement things like this. You introduce some like temporary object, well, not, not a compiler temporary object, but your own kind of temporary variable. To hold the value of x, then you write y into x, and then you write temp into y, and effectively you've swapped x and y. Um, in each of these cases, though, this is going to use a copy operation. So this is going to use a copy, a copy construction to propagate the value of x into temp. It will use copy assignment to propagate the value of y to x, and copy assignment to propagate the value of temp to y. So it's, overall, what we have are three copies. But for, for most interesting types, copies are much less efficient than moves. So could we write this such that we use moves instead of copies? In principle, we could. And that's what I'll look at on the next slide. So one reason we might want to use moves instead of copies would be, again, because of efficiency. Another reason might be, what happens if the type's not copyable? It's only movable. Well, then this algorithm can't work. Although in principle, you should be able to swap the values because you can move them. That's good enough to be able to do a swap. Um, so in, the way we would want to do this instead is we'd want to implement things something like what's shown here. Uh, so what we've done is we've just thrown in a bunch of std moves to force moves to happen in places where normally a copy would happen. But if we look at the code more carefully, we can conclude that the copies can be safely replaced by moves. Um, the reason why, if we kind of walk through this, uh, when, we, we're, when we're doing std move here, this is going to force a move construction operation to take place. So x will get propagated into temp by using a move construction, like a move operation. Um, before we start to panic and go, oh, oh my god, x is used down below here, it's important to look at how it's being used. It's being assigned to. So even though we may be completely mutilating the value of x on this line here, it's okay because we never use that mutilated value. Before we have a chance to use that mutilated value, we're replacing it by another value by assigning over top of it, by assigning value to it. So it's safe to, in this case, it's completely safe to do a move here because even though x is used below, we never look at its value, we just assign over top of whatever was there. So we never have the opportunity to use that mangled value in some kind of bad way. And it's a similar similar story with this line here. By putting in std move, we're going to force a move assignment to happen rather than copy assignment. But this is safe to do because even though y is used below, it's used to basically assign to. So we never actually look at the value of y that we've possibly mangled by the move operation. And then lastly, this last uh, move is safe to insert here, moving from temp to y. Because temp is never used below, right? We hit, temp is a local variable. We hit the end of the function. It's going to get destroyed. No one will have a chance to observe the fact it's been mutilated, its value. So this is categorically safe to replace each of these copies with moves. Of course, when you replace copies with moves, when you start throwing std moves into your code, you have to be careful, right? Because you're saying to the compiler, trust me, I know what I'm doing. It is actually safe to replace the copy with a move, and it will just blindly trust you. If you're right, which we would be in this case, you get more efficient code. But if you're wrong, you end up with code that can fail in very bizarre ways. So you have to be careful about how you use std move. And of course, also don't use std move in cases where it wouldn't move or copy at all. It would have been elided, because if you put the std move in, then basically what happens is you go from doing nothing, eliding the copy or move, to now moving. And then the last thing I want to say with respect to like moving and copying and so on is that sometimes in the course we'll have, in some of the APIs of uh, classes and so on that you need to implement, Sometimes you'll see things which are taking parameters by reference, but they're by R value reference. So you see something that looks like this. I mean, the classic example of this is a move constructor, right? Move constructors essentially by definition take things by R value reference. Um, 
but more generally, you sometimes see parameters, which are you know, not a move constructor, but just a regular sort of function. It may take an R value reference parameter. The significance of R value reference parameters without kind of going into a lot of technical, even yet more technical details about the language is that because of the rules of reference binding, like how, what you can initialize a reference to, um, if you have an R value reference to something, it only could have been initialized by binding it to a temporary object. Because of the way the rules are defined, what you can bind to an R value reference, Essentially, you can only bind R, 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 R value expressions to R value references. So because of this, the only thing that could be that this reference could refer to in this function is a temporary object or something that someone did stupid move to it, which is basically saying, treat it as if it was a temporary object that's safe to obliterate its value and no one will be able to notice it. Um, and and this, the reason why this is important is if you're writing a function, if you're implementing this function here, effectively what you're doing, just like regular, you're taking it by reference so you can modify the value. But the thing is, because it's an R value reference, and R value references only can be bound to temporary objects, when you're implementing this, you know that even if I completely obliterate the value of X, maybe to make the code more efficient, it cannot have any bad effect on the caller because they can never, never observe this change. Um, so typically where you see this in interfaces is places where um, it's, it, it would allow more efficient implementation of the algorithm, whatever Funk is doing in this case. If it knew that it can change the value of X to do its job, and not have any fear that the person who's calling is somehow going to be messed up by me changing the value of x in my implementation, I can do this. So this is a kind of common pattern. And effectively, this is the difference between a copy constructor and a move constructor. The compiler actually sees them as exactly the same thing. They're both doing a copy. The difference is that the one that takes an R value reference, because you know the R value reference only can be bound to a temporary object, implied in that is that function could mutilate the value. In other words, a move constructor could mutilate the value of the parameter that's passed in and you know that no one can notice it. But more generally, you can have any function taking R value references, taking parameters by R value reference. And the idea is when you see this kind of pattern, you know it's safe to mutilate the value of that object. The caller can never observe it. Anyway, so that's the last thing I wanted to say. I'm not going to get into like all the rules of reference binding and so on because it's kind of more than what you need to know. But the most important thing to understand is that R value references can only be bound to either temporary objects or things that are being told to be treated as temporary objects by std move, or more specifically, they can only be bound to R value expressions. If you try to bind an R value reference to an L value expression, the compiler will probably give you an error message saying something like, this must be an R value. And at least now you know what that means. So with that said, I'm gonna completely change tracks here and we're jumping to the exceptions section of the uh, lecture slides. So I wanna talk a little bit about exceptions. We're not gonna do any really super fancy stuff with exceptions in the course, just because there's other kind of higher priority things that I want to look at. Um, but I, want, I need to talk a little bit about exceptions because you are going to use them in some of the assignments to a certain extent. So you need to have a certain level of understanding of exceptions and some of the issues that revolve around them. Um, so exceptions are just a, a language mechanism for handling you know, exceptional circumstances that can arise in code. Um, and. and they're, they're not the only way that you can handle er errors, and we'll look at look, some other ways of handling errors, but it's a mechanism that's built into the language. And essentially what it, it provides is a mechanism whereby you can propagate the, the uh, like in your code, there'd be some place where you detect an error, and then there's another place in the code which is probably not the same place where you want to handle it. And then the issue becomes, well, how do you get the information about I've detected an error in this part of the code, propagate it over to the part of the code that's going to handle it. Um, and exceptions give you a mechanism where the language takes care of this for you. And, and basically this is what we're going to look at. I think that's really all I want to say about this slide. And the place where you're handle, detecting the, the error and handling the error can be completely different places in the code. This is important. Otherwise the, the functionality of, of exceptions would not really be so helpful. So maybe to put the problem that this addresses in maybe a little bit more concrete uh, sort of context, you know, suppose you have some function, the entry point for any C, or some program, the entry point of any program in C++ is main, and then main will call some other thing, and maybe that calls another function, calls another function, calls another function, calls another function, maybe 50 levels deep, and then you're somewhere down in this very low level code, maybe doing I.O., like reading a character from a file or something, and then you get an I.O. error. Then what happens? Well, you know, in, in your application, probably the way that you handle an I.O. error is it's not going to be handled directly in the, the function that was doing the I.O. 
Like maybe if this is a graphical user interface, maybe like the maybe this function here is the one that deals with sort of the main event processing loop for the program. So it's saying like wait for a mouse click, wait for something to happen, and then I do something in reaction to that. Maybe the place that would be appropriate to handle the error would be up here. Would be the code's going to pop up a window and say there was an I/O error. I tried to write this file, it didn't work. Uh, so this is very typical. Is that you, the place where you detect the error is not the place where you want to handle it, and sometimes it's very far away from the place you want to handle it. Like maybe this could be like fifty function calls, you know, 50 levels deep of function calls, and suddenly you have to get the information down here about what failed, like you're writing to a particular file and so on, and it, it, you're reading from a particular file and it failed, and that has to get propagated up here so that that function can do some kind of appropriate thing like pop up a window or something. So how can we do this? And, and this is one, this is essentially what exceptions give us a very kind of clean way to, to address this particular problem. So with traditional error handling, so kind of in the absence of exceptions, the sort of ways that we have to deal with errors on the very most extreme level, we could say any error, we terminate the program. But this is almost never going to be a viable solution in practice. You know, if you imagine you're working at, you know, using your editor, text editor, working very hard on your programming assignment for the course, and then you mistype the name of the file to save to, and then it says it's like an invalid file name, error, terminate, and it, you know, you just lost all your edits you were doing. This would not be a very good solution. So. This is, in practice, like in the vast majority of cases, wouldn't be acceptable. A more reasonable approach might be something like the, what's indicated in the second bullet where you use error codes, like return values of functions are used to signal whether or not things succeed or failed. And if they failed, maybe why they failed or something like that. Um, so this could be passed back through like the return value of function, or maybe you have a reference parameter that's passed in that's not a reference to const, but it's a reference to something you can change, and then you can pass values effectively out through reference parameters. That would be another way, or God forbid, use a global variable like Erno or something like that. You really don't want to do this, but even the standard library, they, they use Erno, which is they're kind of deeply regretting at this point, I guess, um, or probably long ago. Um, so what, some of the downsides of doing things this way, errors are effectively ignored by default because if you're returning, you know, returning say an int or something to say like why something, like maybe zero means success and other non-zero values are various different failure modes, um, there's nothing really to force necessarily the programmer to look at the return value. So you know, I often see this in, in, in students, uh, my graduate students in their research code they're writing and it makes me cringe. Uh, if they have functions that can fail and they don't check if they fail. And then I say, well, how do you know that your results are right? And I say, well, I don't know. It doesn't inspire great confidence. It's, it's a very common sort of thing. So it's, it's a bad, bad news. So, you know, first of all, if you have functions that return values and, and you care whether they succeeded or not, you better check. But even even if you have the discipline to do it, I mean, sometimes you may miss, you know, you have hundreds of places where you need to check, you miss one and then you have a bug. Um, so this is the kind of downside associated with this sort of approach. Also too, because you have to actually be checking return codes in a lot of different places, checking return values of functions, this can clutter up your code. You get like all these ifs all over the place, checking to see like if this function failed, et cetera, et cetera. So it'd be kind of messy, it affects readability, maintainability of the code and so on. Another sort of approach you could use is maybe have some kind of error handling function. So if anything goes wrong in the program, you call this particular function and it will handle, try to recover from the error. Uh, the problem with this is that often there's certain types of errors that maybe can't really be recovered from in this sort of manner. Other times it might be difficult to get the information into the function that needs to be able to do a reasonable job at handling things. So this often doesn't work so well. It's okay in some cases, but maybe not such a viable approach in general. So with uh, the traditional error handling approaches, as I'm calling it, this is illustrating the, like using return values to handle error, handle errors. So here what we have is a function main, which is calling func1, which is calling func2, which is calling func3. And only func3 can actually fail. So the, the idea here is the dot, dot, dot operations in func1, there's nothing that can go wrong, like it just always works. And then in func2, this dot, 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 there's nothing that can go wrong here, it just works. But func3, the dot, dot, dot here, it's doing some operation that could fail, and this is why it's, it's using some variable called success, which it defaults to false, and then depending on whether this dot, dot, dot fails or not, it will set success to true or, or leave it as false. So that the important thing to understand about this example, func3 can fail, but nothing else can fail. But if you're using return codes to indicate fear, this gets kind of messy because if func3 fails, func3 is called by func2, which is called by func1, which is called by main. So the return type of all of these functions has to be dual so that you can propagate all the way back up the call chain the fact that func3 failed because 
Like Funk 2 can't fail and Funk 2 1, Funk 1 can't fail. So in principle, their return value should be void. Like they shouldn't need to pass anything back because like they can't fail. But because they call something else that can fail and you might need to signal back to the person who called you that that thing you called failed, now you get this kind of domino reaction or chain effect where now all the functions in this, in this call chain all have to have non-void return types. And, and you have to worry about all this grossness of saying like, if this thing failed, we do this. If this thing failed, we do this. And it's just kind of ugly. But this is the way that we do, do things if we're using return codes and so on. So like this would not be an approach based on exception handling. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind and then I'll, I'll contrast this with how we would do things with exceptions. So with exceptions, the basic way things work is that uh, when an error condition is detected, you throw an ex what's called an exception. An exception is just an object, like a variable. Uh, and you throw an exception using a throw statement in the language. You say throw and then you give it a variable to throw, an object to throw. And the idea is the, the exception object, the thing that you're throwing, somehow describes the particular error that you've encountered. If it was an I.O. error, maybe like the type of the thing that you're throwing is like an I.O. error type. And then maybe as, as like members, it has something about what was the name of the file that you were accessing when the I.O. error occurred, maybe offset in the file, something like that. And the, the place where you handle, then, then when you throw an exception, the exception will be caught by some other part of the code, which is a handler to handle the error. Um, this is done using a catch clause of a try statement, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and the basic idea is, you know, there's some other part of the code, you'll, you'll, you can handle certain types of problems, and then you can write the code appropriately to handle the types of errors that that, that particular code is intended to handle. And the place, again, where you're handling the code can be different from the place where you're recognizing that there's an error, this is important because often you don't want to handle the error at the same place where you detect the error. And often there are far away parts of the code. Um, the error-free code path, like the, if you basically eliminate a lot of these, uh, as we'll see in a moment, you eliminate a lot of these if conditions here because you just write the code assuming it won't fail. So essentially what your code looks like is the, the error-free path. The only place where the errors are being, are, are, where the, the error, the types of errors that can arise in the code sort of manifest themselves in the places where you're handling the errors. So it, help, it tends to sometimes clean up the code a little bit because it eliminates all these extra ifs, checking to see whether things have failed or not. The language is essentially takes care of this control flow for you and you don't need to put the ifs in. Although as some of you have noticed and they've been using uh, code coverage tools and using branch, uh, branch coverage, I had at least one student who was asking me, there's like, like these branches that I didn't write in my code and it's saying I'm not like getting coverage of them. That's essentially an extra control flow that's being introduced by the compiler to handle exceptions. So it basically, there's kind of ifs there, but it write, the compiler writes it for you. So because it writes it for you, there can't be bugs as long as your compiler is, is, is a reasonable compiler. And it just makes things a lot easier. And the code's cleaner because the, the, it doesn't explicitly appear in your code, the, the control flow that's introduced by the compiler. Um, also, you can argue that uh, error conditions are less likely to go undetected because you have, if you throw an exception and you don't catch it, this will terminate your program with an error message probably saying something like uh, un uncaught exception. Uh, so you kind of forces people not to ignore errors, although I guess you could just, you could still catch it and then ignore it, but you have to go out of your way to ignore it, which is less likely to happen. So if we take the earlier code example and replace it with a scheme that uses exceptions, so we, again, we have like main, which is calling func1, which calls func2, which calls func3, and func3 can fail. The, the main thing that to note compared to the earlier example, which is using return codes is that um, because we're using exceptions to propagate the error information back. In other words, the, the information about what error has occurred is inside this object that we're returning. So we're returning an object, this is something built into the standard library called std run, uh, runtime error, and it takes a string parameter when we construct it. So we're returning this object, and embedded in that object would be everything we need to know to handle the error. Uh, because the exception object is the thing that has this information, notice that func3 doesn't return anything now. It doesn't need to, because essentially the, the error information is sort of a side channel. The exceptions, it's propagated separately from return values. So now this function doesn't need to return anything. It can be void. And these functions also can all be void as well. And if, if anything goes wrong, if this function actually does throw an exception, what happens is you get violently ripped out of this function without completing whatever still needs to be done. You would get thrown back into this function, which called it. You get violently ripped out of this function because there's nothing here to handle the error. You get put back to where you were called from, which is this function here. Because there's not any try catch block here, you get violently ripped out of this function and brought into here where you're called func1. And then here the, it would go, oh, there's a, a try, try block. Now let's try to see if we can handle the error. 
catch dot 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 means catch any exception. So then it would go into this error handling printout failed. Um, so this is kind of the mechanism by which things work. The most important thing to observe here is that we don't need any special return type for the function because essentially the ex exceptions give us kind of a side channel. We don't need to propagate things through return values. Instead, we're propagating it through this mechanism that's provided by the language. And it makes sure that this exception object gets safely propagated to have whoever needs to get it to handle the error. And this is just an example of doing like a safe integer division, an integer division where we check to make sure we're not dividing by zero before we actually do the division. So here we have like, a, this is using, not using exceptions. So we take two integers, we want to divide one into the other, and we're checking to make sure the thing we're dividing by is not zero. Uh, but because we're using return values, we have to propagate whether things succeeded or failed back as part of the return value. So this leads to grossness like this, where we use maybe a pair, we're going to return a Boolean to say whether things were even successful in the first place. And then if things were successful, the int part of the pair is what the return value was. But this, this, this is kind of gross in some ways. Um, it'd be better to maybe do things in, in using exceptions. In this case, there, there's no need to propagate whether things failed or succeeded as part of the return value because this is handled by the exception object. If something goes wrong, the error you know, information is propagated through exceptions. So now we just return an int. It makes the code kind of much more readable. We're you know, dividing two numbers, we're returning an int. Um, then what happens is the person who's using that function, if, if they want to be able to handle a failure, what they do is they wrap the call to the function, safe divide, inside this try block. And then try block is followed by one or more catch blocks, which will catch certain types of exceptions that might be thrown. So in this case, if it tried to divide by zero, this would throw an overflow error exception. This would cause you to end up back in this function here, and then you would go to this catch block to catch the overflow error, and then it would just print out division by zero. Anyway, so this just gives you a kind of very simple example. And then I have a few slides to skip over. Um, again, the tr I've kind of touched on some of these issues already, but there's, there's trade-offs. I mean, it's, it's not entirely clear, but there, there's some downsides to using exceptions, and there are some, some companies that you go to that you will never use exceptions if you go to them, because there are downsides to using exceptions. Um, which I'll get to in a moment. So advantage of, of exceptions, um, they allow for error handling to easily be separated from the code that detects the error, much more easy than if you're using return codes, because with return codes, you have all these ifs and you're propagating the, the error information back in the terms of return codes. With exceptions, it just gets propagated for you through the exception mechanism of the language. Um, yeah, and I guess this kind of covers these points as well. The, the disadvantage of exceptions, well, there, there's really two. Um, the first one is that writing code that behaves uh, correctly in the presence of exceptions is hard to do. It's hard to write what's called exception safe code, code that when you start throwing, throwing exceptions, it still works correctly. Um, the, the easy part is, is throwing exceptions are easy. Throw statement done. Uh, catching exceptions easy, try catch block done. The hard part about exceptions is everything else. In other words, the 99.999999% of your code. Um, the stuff that's not the throw statement and not the catch block, which is basically almost everything else, the mil you know, millions of other lines of code in your program. So in other words, it's really hard to write exception safe code. Uh, but nevertheless, if, if you're using exceptions, it's, you have to be able to do this. Uh, the other downside, and this is the reason why maybe some companies or some projects you might be working on, they will say thou shalt not use exceptions, is that um, I think a lot of people would tend to agree, the people like involved with the, the C++ standardization effort that in retrospect, they, they, I think C++ kind of got things wrong in terms of how they implemented exceptions. They're, they're not zero, like most things in the language are, you, you, you only pay, you don't pay for what you don't use. So if you don't use, like you don't throw exceptions, there's no price that you pay. But this is not the case with exceptions. Even if you don't throw exceptions, you don't really use them, you pay a price. So probably any C++ compiler you find will have an option that says to shut off exceptions completely. There are no exceptions, don't try throwing, you know, don't, don't do anything because it ain't gonna work because it's not, 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 the code's not gonna be generated for it. And the reason, reason why they do that is because in some situations, this is a cost that you would pay would be unacceptable. Therefore, they just basically say, we're not using exceptions anywhere in the code and we're even gonna enable this option for the compiler saying, you know, don't even try to generate any code related to exceptions uh, because nobody's gonna use them anyway. And, and by the way, just as a side comment, there is a proposal kind of working its way through, which maybe by C++23 maybe might creep into the standard, which is a new mechanism for handling exceptions, which is much more lighter weight and will address these issues.
Anyway, so exceptions are not the be all and end all, I guess is what I'm saying, at least as they're currently defined in the language, they do have downsides, which might cause you not to want to use them in certain, like maybe very high performance or other applications. So as I mentioned before, exceptions are objects. So when you throw an exception, what you're doing is you're giving a variable to the throw statement, which gets propagated. Um, typically the type of the object will indicate kind of a class of error that can occur maybe like an IO error or something like that. And then the value that that object has gives additional information to say, like if it was indicating an IO error, that particular type of object, then it might say like, what was, what was the name of the file that the IO error occurred for and stuff, this would be embedded in the, the value of the object. So the, essentially the, the exception object tells you what you would need to know in order to handle the particular error that's occurred. Uh, exception objects can have any type, uh, but more typically there'll be a class type, like a user defined type. You could throw an int, if you wanted to, like throw 42. But the thing is when code sees like an instant thrown, like what does that mean, who knows? Like it's kind of so obscure. Normally you would define your own types. If you have a type that's being thrown that's like IO error, well then obviously it's an IO error. But if someone throws an int, what does that mean? Who only, God only knows. So typically there'll be like some kind of class type and usually they're, de they're uh, derived from, there's a class called std exception in the standard library. Typically they're derived using the true inheritance derived from this class. And there's other ones that are already derived from exception class, which you can use. And probably for the purposes of this course, the ones that are provided are probably good enough for our purposes. The ones that are provided in the standard library. Um, exception processing disrupts the normal control flow as we'll see as I look at this in a little bit more detail in subsequent slides. So what I mean by this is that you know, like normally code executes like linearly, unless you have a, you know, something that cause a branch, like an if statement or a, like a loop or something, normally you execute in sequence. But when you start having exceptions thrown into the mix, then, then code can start jumping kind of all over the place because there's additional control flow that's introduced by the exception handling mechanisms of the language. And it's not explicit. In other words, you don't see like if statements or branches or anything, but they're there. And you will notice them, for example, if you're using branch coverage and then you start, you're actually using code that has exceptions in it. And they say, start saying, hmm, what's going on here? It's, it's saying that I didn't, there's a branch here and there's no obvious branch in the code. And it's complaining I only took one of the, one, the branch in one direction. Well, probably what's happening is that code could have, maybe as a function call, it might be returning because of an exception being thrown or not being thrown. And then it has to handle both of those cases and so on. Um, anyway, so it's important to understand it introduces sort of implicit control flow that's not explicit in the code, but nevertheless, it's there. Um, so the next few slides just list some standard exception classes in the standard library. So they're basically all derived. This is kind of like a top level exception class and then other ones, there's subclasses and so on that are derived from it. Um, you know, for example, like if you have a logic error, or like runtime error, you might use these particular classes. There's a bunch of them. The particular types are not really so important for our purposes here. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say about this. And it kind of goes on for a few slides. And the list that's there might not necessarily be exhaustive. There might be some others that are missed. Um, anyway, enough about exception types. They're not really very interesting. You can always look through the list later. Um, in terms of throwing exceptions, so the mechanism whereby you sort of initiate the processing of an error is by throwing an exception. So you basically throw some kind of object. Um, so maybe something like this. We, we well, you, again, probably you don't want to throw things that have kind of basic built-in types. Like you probably don't want to throw like a like a, a character literal like this. Like basically something that's sort of like a const char star. Um, but anyway, we can do it. So you could still do something like this, and then you could have a. a a try statement where you're doing something that might might throw, that might cause this throw statement to occur, and then you say something like catch, and then you can catch like a, something of character, a const char star type. So if this throw statement happened as a result of some code in dot, dot, dot here, what would happen is you get violently ripped out of the try block and you get come into this catch block and then handle the error. But again, probably you wouldn't want to throw something like a char star, You'd probably throw some user defined type. Um, I think probably a lot of this stuff I've already covered, at least the stuff that's important with respect to this course. So I talked about exception objects. Um, anything else I want to say? Oh, if you're if you're actually throwing an object, then it has to have either be copyable or movable, and also it needs to be have a destructor as well. Um, it needs to have a destructor because, well, obviously, if you create the object at some later point, it's going to need to be destroyed. So you, you kind of need a destructor, otherwise, the compiler is going to have problems later when it tries to destroy the object. Uh, but it also needs copy or it needs to be copyable or movable because 
Um, when you give the object, you know, when you throw it, throw a, throw an exception. I mean, for example, maybe the thing you're throwing is a local variable. This is not an uncommon thing. Maybe you're throwing like a. We have an example here. Yeah, like here, for example, the thing that we're throwing. Yeah, like in this throw statement, we're throwing. Oh, sorry, this is maybe not a good example. Anyway, but even if you imagine, for example, you're just throwing, like ignore all the other fluff on this line. If you're just saying like throw stood overflow error addition, like semicolon, you're basically throwing like a, a, a temporary object or a placeholder for a temporary object that's local to this function. You're throwing a local variable. So when you get violently ripped out of this function doing the, doing the throw statement, that object's going away because it's a local variable. So because of this, the language needs a way to, or the, there needs to be a mechanism whereby the compiler is allowed to take the thing that you're throwing and make a copy of it, either by copying or moving. Because the thing, a lot of the time, the thing that you're throwing is going to about to go away because you're getting ripped out of the function. It's a local variable. It's going to be destroyed. So this is the reason why there's the, the constraint that it needs to be essentially be copyable, movable. It needs to be able to be moved around by the compiler so it can make sure that it's in some place that it's not going to be destroyed uh, before you're done with it. And it may get copied and moved around a number of places before it actually gets handled at some later point. And then in terms of catching exceptions, the way that you catch exceptions, you've seen some examples of this, kind of simpler examples on some earlier slides. But the idea is that if you have some code that might cause an exception to be thrown, you put it inside of a try block. So this would be where this comment in would be the code that, uh, what the comment is, is where the code that would possibly be throwing an exception. And then you can have as many catch blocks as you want after the try block, or sorry, catch clauses after the try block as you want. And you can catch different types of errors. So for example, if the thing that was thrown here was a logic error, then it would, it would come into this code here, and the exception would be available through the variable E, and you could process the error here. If it's through a runtime error, you would come into this code, and the variable E would be a reference to the actual exception object that was thrown. And then dot, dot, dot is just like, like anything. So, and it does them in the order that they're listed. So this would, this would just be kind of a catch-all for any ones that weren't caught by the earlier catch uh, clauses. Uh, when you're catching exceptions, uh, it's, it's a good idea to catch exceptions by reference. So one of the reasons why is you want to try to avoid copying because maybe the thing that threw the exception in the first place, you're trying to copy or move or whatever, well, probably more likely copy, and maybe this need to allocate memory, but you ran out of memory, and now that's why it's throwing an exception. So if while you're processing the exceptions, you force an exception to be copied again, this could cause an exception to be thrown because the copy happens by a copy constructor. The copy constructor may be doing things that could cause an exception to be thrown. And as we'll see momentarily, if you throw an exception while you're processing exception, this will kill your program because you're not allowed to throw exceptions while an exception is actually in, in flight, like being processed. So it's a good idea to catch exceptions by reference, like basically what was being done here. Like you could leave out the ampersand and then you're going to be, and also the const as well, and then you're going to be catching by value. So it will copy the exception object into E. And it's kind of like a local variable, but here we're catching by reference. So there's no copy. It will just refer to wherever that exception object is sitting in memory. Um, also, catching by reference is a good idea in, in situations, well, it's necessary in cases where sometimes you want to catch the exception change the exception object, like modify it, and then re-throw the exception. So you're not really handling it, but you want to add some additional information into the exception object for the person up above who's eventually going to be called, handling the error. Uh, if you catch it by value, sure, you can change the value of the exception object, but it gets thrown away. You're, doing, you're just modifying a local copy of it. So this is another reason you might want to catch uh, by reference. And then slicing, I'm not going to talk about because we don't really talk about inheritance much in this course at all. It pertains more to inheritance. And then there's a bunch of slides here which go into a bit more detail than what we need, so I'll just skip over them. Um, you can re-throw an exception. So for example, suppose that I have some code that might throw an exception, so I have a try block, and then this catch block, well, this will catch anything because of the dot, dot, dot. But I can then say, well, well I, I want to actually take the object that I've caught and, and throw it again. Um, so in this case here, if I'm catching like dot, 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 obviously I don't really know what it is. Like there's no name that I can refer to that object by, but I can just say throw. If you say throw, this is just saying like re-throw the exception that was just caught. Um, so sometimes you want to do this, although typically you wouldn't just catch it and then throw it immediately. Maybe you might do something like you catch it, you may modify some of the data in the object and then re-throw it with additional information added, for example. 
Although in this case, you can do it because there's no variable name by which you can refer it because we're using dot, dot, dot. But if you caught it with like some, some specific type, you might then modify it and then rethrow it, for example. And again, there's some more detail. And then this, this is, I need to go through in a bit more detail because this is, this is kind of the, that somehow kind of lies at the heart of why it is that it's difficult to write exception safe code, like code that works correctly and the process of, of exceptions. Um, and we'll come back to this even in more detail a little bit later in the course. I've sort of split the part on exceptions over two different parts in time in the course. Doing the more basic stuff at the beginning, we'll come back and look at some of the more nuanced stuff a little bit later. Um, but at least the more nuanced stuff we don't need too badly in this course. Um, so it can be deferred to a little bit later. Anyway, so as I was mentioning, when you, when you throw an exception, what, basically what this causes to ha happen is a process called stack unwinding, where essentially this is the process that gets you from the place where the throw statement is happening to the place where you're actually ultimately catching the exception and handling it. And this requires some kind of process, because again, you're, you're basically kind of getting violently ripped out of code blocks and put into other places and eventually propagating back to the point where you hit a, a try block with a catch clause that can catch the exception that was thrown. So this whole messy process is referred to stack unwinding, uh, typically because the stuff is stored on the stack and they're basically unwinding, un like basically undoing the big mess that was created by throwing the exception. And what other things I want to say? So if if so, basically the way it works is when you when you throw an exception, it can it transfers control to the nearest handler that, that is appropriately typed that can handle that type of exception. And what's by meant what by nearest is it's a block that was most recently entered. And I'll I'll explain this by way of an example in a moment. This this might not necessarily be entirely clear just from the verbiage that's on the on the slide. Um, but an example will make things a bit more clear. If there's no matching handler found, so in other words, you throw an exception but no one catches it. This is a program error, and, and basically the standard requires that you term, the program is terminated by calling std terminate. Uh, so it's, it's an, a serious error not to catch an exception that's thrown, which just sort of makes sense, right? You're saying something's seriously wrong here, and you don't even bother try to handle it. So the compiler's not going to try to guess what to do. It will just terminate your program. And when, when you're kind of going through this process of being like, progressively being kind of being ripped out of uh, successive blocks in the code. Any local variables that reach the end of their lifetime because the block that they're in is going away, they, their destructors get called. This is really important. This is the only guarantee the language makes. As it's you know violently ripping you out of blocks and not finishing executing the code in those blocks, the only guarantee it makes is that it will call destructors appropriately, which means that you cannot rely on any kind of code executing that's not in a destructor. If you, there's some critical cleanup that you need to do and you're writing code where exceptions can be thrown, if you don't do that cleanup in a destructor, you're going to leak those resources that you needed to clean up. And, and we'll see this in a little bit more detail when we go through an example. Um, is there anything else I want to say for this slide? Well, maybe a few, few other details here. Um, because the language guarantees that any objects that have been constructed will be destroyed, like local variables that are local to blocks that are being left, that are being left due to an exception being thrown, you're guaranteed that they'll be destroyed. So there has to be some notion of, well, when does the lifetime of the variable, when is it deemed to start living? Like, because the compiler will only destroy things that were deemed to start living in the first place. Um, so th this is what this bullet here is, is kind of talking about, is that as far as the compiler is concerned, uh, an object starts living, its lifetime begins once its constructor successfully returns. So the reason why this is important, the subtlety here is if during a, like some processing in a constructor, an exception is thrown, that object is never deemed to start living. Therefore, the compiler will not call a destructor for that object because it was never created in the first place. So what this implies is if you're doing things in, in inside of a constructor, if there are situations where it could, it could return due to an exception, like it doesn't finish its job, you need to be careful that you do the cleanup of any resources before you leave that constructor because the destructor will never get called if the, if the constructor is failing due to an exception being thrown. And, oh, and one last thing as well, this relates to the, the comment I made earlier, this last bullet on the slide, is that thou shalt not throw an exception while an exception is being processed. This is like a requirement of the standard. It sort of makes sense, right? Because if I'm processing an error and then yet another error happens, like you could, if you don't disallow this, then you could get into a situation where it's not just another one occurs, then another one, another one, another one, another one. Next thing you know, there's like a hundred million errors all kind of in flight at the same time. And it's like, this could be bad news. So 
they, they disallow this sort of thing from happening. Uh, but because you, you can't have an exception thrown when you're processing the exception, and because one critical thing which is done many, many times when you're processing exceptions, destructors are being called all over the place. So if you throw exceptions and destructors, this is really, really bad news because it just may, it's kind of screaming like, please throw another exception when I'm processing the exception. Because one of the main places where destructors are called is during the so-called stack unwinding process, the cleanup process that's happening when you're processing an exception. So you know that's happening when you're processing exceptions. So if you throw another exception during one of those destructor being called, now you have a situation where you're processing an exception, you've thrown another exception, and now your program is toast because the language doesn't let you do this. So the kind of the general rule is like thou shalt not throw exceptions from destructors. There may be some very kind of rare edge cases where maybe for some bizarre reason you might want to do this, but as a general rule, you, you really want to avoid this unless it absolutely can't be for some reason. And probably in most, use, most reasonable cases of how you write your code, most reasonable cases probably it would never be needed, at least if the code is kind of designed in a good way. Um, and with that said, I guess I can, I have to, unfortunately, I have to stop at the part where things kind of get more interesting where I can do an example. But I'll go through this example in the next uh, lecture. This is kind of going to explain the, the so-called stack unwinding process. What happens when you throw an exception and how are our destructors called and so on to make sure that any local variables that are being killed because we're leaving the blocks that they were defining due to the exception, how they're cleaned up by destructor calls. Mm -hmm. So when you say uh, the destructor doesn't if the exception is thrown in the uh, constructor, the constructor doesn't get called. So if you have something... Wasn't, sorry, did you say constructor or constructor? Yeah, so when an exception is thrown in the constructor, okay. if, um, if you have like some, one of the, uh, the variables numbers in your fields, in your uh, initialize, you initialize this with like a new or something, to allocate memory, are you saying that that new memory you allocate out, you out, you when you initialize the list never gets uh, yeah, this is the sort of thing you need to be careful about. Like, if you've allocated memory in the constructor, like you got partway through, like if you fail right away, it's yeah. not a big problem. But let's suppose you get partway through the constructor, you've allocated some memory with you, and all of a sudden now you get an exception from. If you don't, if you leave that constructor before you clean up that memory, like free it, it will leak because the, the normally the place where you free the memory is in the destructor, right? But the destructor right. won't get called ever because the compiler hasn't deemed that object to actually come to life. Because the, if the constructor doesn't succeed, the compiler goes like, partly. Can, if I partly make something living, that's not living. So it's not in, in existence yet. So we want yeah. to in the actual constructor, clean up and then repro. So like what you would need to do in the situation you're describing, you have to maybe use a try block and catch the exception internally, then free the memory that you allocated with you, and then re-throw the, well, the exception will be re-thrown automatically, but you could re-throw it if you want. Can you throw an exception, an exception happen in the initialize list also? It can happen anywhere. There's lots of stuff where things can go wrong in constructors. It, when you're initializing, like associated with the initializer list and the actual brace bracket body of the constructor, or if you're initializing base class objects if you're using inheritance. So there's like lots of places where things can go wrong, which is why this becomes an issue. There's lots of places where you need to be careful about this. Anyway, sorry to 